Here at Shortwave Space Camp, we escape our everyday lives to explore the mysteries and quirks of the universe. We find weird, fun, interesting stories that explain how the cosmos is partying all around us. From stars to dwarf planets to black holes and beyond, we've got you. Listen now to the Shortwave Podcast from NPR. Are you enjoying this podcast? Well, you have KUOW members to thank for that. KUOW members make the trusted local journalism and storytelling you hear on this show possible. Become a member today and help support the production of this podcast. It only takes a minute. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. You're listening to Soundside. I'm Libby Dankman. DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, is a policy President Obama enacted by executive order in 2012. And it's had a rocky legal journey. We'll get into more on that. But when it was still accepting new applications, DACA was open to undocumented young people who graduated from high school or served in the military and were brought to the U.S. as children. The program has given roughly 800,000 people access to things like a driver's license, a social security number, and a work permit. When the Trump administration came into office, remember, I mentioned that rocky road, Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced that things would be changing. Good morning. I'm here today to announce that the program known as DACA that was effectuated under the Obama administration is being rescinded. That was in September of 2017. Within hours, immigration attorney Luis Cortez Romero, a DACA recipient himself based in Kent, Washington, helped assemble a team of legal heavy hitters and plaintiffs who were committed to taking on the Trump administration in federal court. Cortez Romero and his colleagues took the fight all the way to the highest court in the land and successfully defended DACA. In the process, he became the first undocumented person to help argue a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, Luis Cortez Romero is the subject of a new documentary. It's called From Here, From There, De Aquí, De Allá. And it premieres on the PBS series Voces tomorrow, Tuesday, July 9th. Luis Cortez Romero joins me in studio now here at KUOW. Hey, Luis, thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So how does it feel to have a documentary about your life premiering? I mean, what is that like? <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's it's a little unreal sometimes. And you definitely become very self-aware of all your mannerisms when you start seeing yourself on screen. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as a, I, I consider myself a bit of a storyteller myself as I... You know, and I and I say this to a lot of my clients that you know I can't guarantee that we're going to win each case, but I I can guarantee that they're going to hear your story. And mm-hmm. so um, to then have a story be told about me, you know, it's it's kind of a little weird to be an awkward to be on this side of it, but definitely very honored to, to them have me follow me around for all this time. How when did the process start? Because they were there with you, like even when you were first looking at this challenge and and you know getting it rolling, and then they were there with you when you heard about the opinion from the Supreme Court? Like, when did the documentary actually begin filming? Yeah, I mean, I they started filming in, in 2019. Mm. Um, and so by that point, the case had already kind of started going. Um, and I um, was contacted by Mo, uh, the director of the of the film and said, hey, you know, we're do we're interested in this DACA story. Do you mind if we we tag along? And um, at the time, really, my my attitude about it was, sure, just like, don't get in the way. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, you guys can come along if you want, but there's a lot going on. And so, um, you know, uh, catch up if you can. And yeah, so, I'm not going to slow down. Yeah. And so they, they've been very great about it. And, and yeah. And so they were, they've been kind of along every step along the way. And, you know, one of the things that got thrown into the mix was that COVID got thrown in there. Mm-hmm. And so it was hard to know how where is this going to go how we can continue to film even though we have all these restrictions now so uh, but we made it work yeah marlene morris director marlene morris is mo uh, as you heard Luis refer to there you grew up in the bay area you're the only child in your family who is a daca recipient you're the oldest and everyone else all the siblings were born in the united states right and it was really interesting to kind of see you reflect with your mom and your grandparents uh about how that affected your family dynamics. Like at the point at which you realized you were undocumented, you had been prepping to go to an um, amazing European trip with your school class and you'd sold all this chocolate. Like you were the you know best chocolate seller in that class, but you couldn't go. And, and that kind of like 
uh, started the conversation about the fact that you didn't have documentation. How did your identity as an undocumented kid affect your family dynamics? I think one of the big aspects of it was you you kind of find out what it means to be undocumented as you're living your life. And so um, at first I just knew like that I wasn't born here and I didn't really know what that meant. And then when I wasn't able to go with the rest of my classmates to this European class, class or this European trip, I then realized, okay, well, I, I can't travel abroad. But then it became, now I can't get a driver's license. Now I'm going to have a difficult time finding a job. Now I'm going to have a difficult time having access to college. Uh, I may not be able to practice law. And so it all is kind of this evolving thing. Like, what does it really mean to not have status in America? And it was able, I think, for my siblings to really acknowledge some of the privileges that they had, just like something as simple as getting a driver's license and how it was very simple for them to get it. Um, My siblings have been able to visit family in Mexico. And so they were able to make those connections. And so I think it really highlighted some of the the privileges that they have of having status. It, it also made some of them a little less risk adverse. So they were less less worried about getting in trouble and things like that because they, they had less of a ripple effect for them. So it definitely impacted our, our dynamic in a big way. You are at the University of Idaho because it's amazingly, this shows how expensive it is to go to college. Um, it was cheaper for you to go to the University of Idaho from California rather than pay in-state tuition uh, for law school. And there's this amazing scene that you uh, recount where you're in your car ready to leave Idaho. It's snowy out and you're on the phone with your mom and you're saying, I am as an undocumented kid, I am unable to practice law, so I'm leaving. And your mom says what? My mom can be sometimes a tough love person. And and she said, no, you are not coming back. It wasn't like, oh, come home, baby. Yeah. Like, OK, you know, yeah. that, that's terrible. Let me like comfort you. It's like, no, no. Yeah. She said, <laughs> you know, you started this. You have to finish it. Um, she goes, we don't know what's going to happen. You may not be able to practice law after you graduate. But um, one thing that she said very clearly was, you know, they, they're not you're not going to be able to you can unlearn what they've taught you there. Yeah. And it's very valuable when we don't get to these spaces. And so you need to just get as much as you can from this experience, and then we'll figure the rest of it out later. Um, and if you're going to leave the University of Idaho, you're going to do it the right way, having graduated. And so um, she made it very clear, you're not coming back <laughs> to the Bay Area unless you, you're you coming back with that diploma. You're not welcome home without the diploma. Right. <laughs> so how soon after that did... DACA get announced. The Obama administration announces this new status for kids like you who were brought to this country as children. About almost two years later. Wow. Yeah. So the rest of the time, it was just me navigating with a lot of hope um, that something would happen um, and really trying to squeeze out all of the experience that I could during that time. So joining every legal clinic that I can be a part of, every internship that I can be a part of. Because as far as I was concerned, I had those three years to be uh, like a baby lawyer during law school. And then and then I don't know what was going to happen after. Yeah. So you end up settling in the Seattle area in Kent. What brought you here? So after I graduated from the University of Idaho, there was um, I got a job out here. And my my original plan was to be here for about a year and then maybe go back to California, go back to the Bay Area and then kind of settle, settle back over there. And. Once I got here and I started working in immigrants' rights and specifically with individuals in deportation proceedings, and I started working with individuals who were detained in Tacoma. Um, you know, I don't know how many people know this, but Tacoma is home base for one of the largest for-profit migrant detention centers in um, in the country. And so I started doing a lot of work there um, with individuals who were detained and I realized, you know, there's a lot of really good people doing a lot of good work here around this, around a lot of different parts, but specifically around individuals who were detained. And so one year then turned into two years and then it turned into three years. And then, you know, it really kind of won my heart over and I said, I'm staying. So now I've been here for a while. So your work with the detention center in Tacoma kind of precipitates this involvement in the Supreme Court defense of DACA. Um, and that has to do with the case of Daniel Ramirez Medina who was a DACA recipient living in Des Moines. I said he had gang affiliations because of a tattoo, um, and they arrested him, even though he had DACA. How did you end up representing 
Daniel. Was this kind of a routine case at first? We got a call from his brother, and it was a Friday late morning, and he told me that his brother was picked up by ICE, but that his brother had DACA. Mm. And so I told his brother, you know, they're, it's probably a mistake. They're going to realize he has DACA. They're going to let him go. But if they don't let him go or something happens, just call me back. Call me back, and, and we can figure this out. And so he calls me back in the afternoon and he lets me know he's now in Tacoma. And so I know from experience that once you've made it into Tacoma, they've already processed you. They already looked into you. So they've made the decision to detain you. And the way that I, that I was able to get involved with this case was that I was like their fifth call, but because it was a Friday and not a lot of people do work in the detention settings, everybody else had told him, you know, we're going to go, we could maybe go see Daniel on Monday or Tuesday of next week. But I remember thinking, man, I would be really freaked out if all of a sudden I have DACA, I'm telling ICE that, and I get profiled, and now I'm in detention center. So I would want answers quickly. So I went that same day, and I said, let me go talk to him. So I was able to go that same Friday and and go talk to Daniel because I remember thinking I would want someone to do that for me. I wouldn't want to wait all weekend for answers. And that's how I started building a relationship with Daniel, and he told me, you know, that that were accusing him as, as a gang member. And I remember thinking like, man, you'd be the worst gang member ever. He was so sentimental when I saw him there. He was in tears and he said like, I don't know, I don't want to be detained. I've never been in trouble. And I remember thinking, man, you, you, I do not want you in my gang. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't, <laughs> you're, you're not my ideal <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gang yeah, partner yeah. or whatever. Um, and, you know, he's a young dad. You know, they kind of show up with his son, which is really sweet in the documentary. So Daniel Ramirez's case becomes sort of like this focal point for this team of national legal experts that you help convene that starts to work together on, hey, if the Trump administration, you know, the the ICE under the Trump administration is targeting a DACA recipient in this way, you know, they seems like there's signs that they have their sights set on this program. Um, and then we have later that same year that Daniel's arrested Jeff Sessions announcing the rescinding of DACA overall. But you're ready at that point, right? Because you have all of these people who have been working on Daniel's case and you're on the phone within hours. It looks like, according to the documentary, to start to assemble the legal team. And you have to start looking for plaintiffs to you know, mount a challenge to this uh, rescinding of DACA. W- what does that process look like? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the one of the reasons that this kind of cross section of plaintiffs came about was because originally uh, the legal team has suggested for me to be the lead plaintiff on this case and for them to bring a lawsuit on my behalf. And so they brought this to me and they said, why we could sue and we, you could be the, you know, the name plaintiff, you have this great story. And so uh, we think it would be great. I had Daniel in mind when that happened, because when we filed a lawsuit on Daniel's behalf, the government came down very hard on Daniel and his dad. And I remember thinking that there might be some retaliatory impacts on this. Mm. I have clients I have to think about. I have my mom that I have to think about. And so I was worried. I told the team, you know, give me give me a day or two to think about it. Two things came to mind. One was I was a little worried about it, but I also really wanted to work on the case as part of the team, not necessarily just be the face of the case. And so I knew that if I was going to say no to them, that I I wanted to come with something else. So I started making phone calls and I started calling the doctor that I knew, different doctor recipients that I knew. And I said, hey, would you be interested in this? And I need to know right away, like yeah. t- today. <laughs> so fast yeah. for to make such a huge decision. Yeah. And like what goes into that? Because, I mean, who is the person? who can understand all of the repercussions of being the face of a case like this and still say, I am going to do this. I am going to be one of these six plaintiffs whom you finally landed on. Yeah. And and that was part of the conversation. And some of them said, well, give me like an hour or so. I got to talk to my family or I got to talk to my partner or whoever. And, you know, we made it clear, like, we don't know what the Trump administration might do and what actions they may take. If you become the face of this and and also just the public, you know, the, the immigration is such a hot button issue and you put your name and face out there and your story out there, people are going to know and, and you might get all sorts of reactions, which which did happen. But it, it really goes to show you how brave these plaintiffs were in saying yes. Um, we did have a few that said no, um, that said that they did not want to be part of it. And I definitely understood and respected it. So once I got these plaintiffs to say yes, I went back to the team and said, well, here's the thing. 
I want to be part of the team, so it's a no for me, but look at these folks who I got together. And it was an across- Look at this all-star folks. lineup. Yeah, all-star lineup. <laughs> and so they agreed on it, and then and then we started from there. Dulce Garcia is one of the, um, or is she the lead plaintiff? Yes. And can you tell me a little bit about her? Yeah, so Dulce is also uh, a fellow lawyer. Uh, she's based out of San Diego. Uh, she's originally from Mexico. And um, she has an amazing story where she grew up very low, low income. At some point was homeless with her family as they were trying to make ends meet. And eventually was able to slowly but surely start progressing and uh, graduated from college, uh, went on to law school, graduated from law school, and started her own practice um, and started her own business. She employs U.S. citizens uh, as part of her practice. And she is one of many stories, but I think really encapsulates the stories of of how hardworking the DACA recipients are. And when we took the case to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, when the decision came out, I mean, when I think about it, it still it still gets me a little choked up because the first few words of the decision is to say that Dulce Garcia embodies um, the American dream is not hyperbole, and and it's true, and 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 I think it also really went to show how impactful the stories of these DACA recipients were. Yeah. And so the path of this legal challenge, a judge had issued an injunction to prevent the Trump administration from immediately ending DACA while it worked its way through the courts. Then the administration appealed to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit ruled in the way that you just explained, in the plaintiff's favor. The Supreme Court then fast-tracks it, gets it in front of the justices rather quickly. And your legal team brings on attorney Ted Olson, who is a conservative attorney. He's kind of a surprising choice to join what one would assume is a liberal group of lawyers and plaintiffs, right? So Ted Olson's involvement was controversial. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So when, um, you know, we had the firm Gibson Dunn involved from the from the very beginning, and, and Ted Olson is, is part of that firm. And so once the case got to the Supreme Court, there was discussions about Ted becoming involved. And there was some controversy amongst amongst I think different folks. I think the 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 immigrants' rights folk, you know, were a little suspicious about why does he want to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, He's a former Reagan Justice Department lawyer. That's you know, right. That's it's right. Just not who you immediately think of as being the face of it. Yeah. Right. And and there was a, a kind of another part of it like we had People who have been in the immigrant rights movement for so long as the one who's kind of bringing in this case. And so we should be the ones defending it. And so there was a lot of there was just a lot of controversy around it. And I think my. Did you agree with the criticism? I thought it was fair to want to know more about why he wants to do it. And so my my first reaction was, well, he needs to meet with us, the DACA recipients and all of us and, and explain what this means to him and uh, whether he really thinks that we should be able to stay here, regardless of this case. Or if it's just he's taking it on as a legal challenge, to whether he can win it. Right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so that was very important to us. And so we threw that out there saying, hey, would would he meet with us? And he met with us several times. He met with all of the plaintiffs um, out in D.C. and he made time to talk to every single one of us. He talked to us about how he truly believes in this program and how he truly believes, regardless of this case, that we belong here and that this is a cause that he just truly, genuinely believes in. And I believed him. I also knew that Ted Olson was somebody who had a tremendous amount of experience arguing before the Supreme Court, a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge. He had represented presidents. He had worked as the Solicitor General representing the United States before the Supreme Court. He had uh, represented other clients at the Supreme Court. This would have been his 65th case uh, before the court. And so we knew that we needed that that level of experience and expertise to help us construct this this argument. The other part of it is we also were very clear-eyed about the makeup and composition of the court. We had a, a conservative-leaning court. Even then. Even yeah. then. Mm-hmm. Yes, even then. Before Amy Coney Barrett. And was that before Kavanaugh, too? That was right after Kavanaugh. After Kavanaugh, right? but before Barrett, yeah. That's right. And so really we knew we had Chief Justice Roberts was essentially considered like the, the middle vote or the one that we had to influence. And so there was also, uh, you know, I felt that we needed someone who can speak these arguments in their language. How how can we have these arguments attach themselves to conservative principles um, that would still make sense regarding 
how this case was put together, what what this case means, and why we're right, even under conservative a conservative viewpoint. Um, so his his expertise on that was also very very important. Mm. So this is a consolidated case that eventually makes it to the Supreme Court. It's under the name UC Regents versus the Department of Homeland Security. Oral arguments challenging the end of ending of DACA um, start in November 2019. What's happening on that day? Like, how does it feel in the court? Like, what are you thinking as the oral arguments are unfolding? Tell me, bring us into that room. So I arrive with Ted to the Supreme Court. And um, as I'm arriving to the court, um, you know, everybody knows in the court knows who he is from the janitorial staff is saying hi to him as we're walking in the security staff. They all know him. And so it's kind of like walking around with the cool guy. Yeah, you it's know? like old old reunion with the big man on campus. Yeah. And so, <laughs> the quarterback is yeah. back. And so he's and, and, and as we're walking in, he's telling me, you know, like he's giving me little tidbits about the court. This is what this what this space is. And. Eventually, we make it first to this room called the attorney's room, where the attorneys get to kind of hang out at first before the arguments. And he's introducing me to different government officials who are there ready to watch the the argument. Uh, Janet Napolitano was there who worked for the Biden administration. And it was very a little surreal to meet her because I was like, oh, you signed a DACA memo that allowed me to have DACA. That's so crazy. But there was a moment where I'm like, okay, we need to... We need to kind of center ourselves and focus because there's a lot that needs to going on. It's a lot of spinning plates that we have to consider um, when we're putting orchestrating this together because we are thinking they may want facts and specific figures and we need to be able to point those to those right away. They may want a historical perspective on it. So we may need to have those. And so like just knowing where everything is to be able to provide that information. Is it storytelling or is it data? Right. And we need to be ready for both. And we need to kind of be able to merge both, even if they're asking for one or the other. Yeah. And so as we're walking to the courtroom, the first thing I kind of notice is that it's very small. I was expecting this grandiose room, but it's tiny. And as we're walking in, all heads turn almost like a wedding, right? As when the bride's walking in. Because it's such a small place, we're super close to the justices. We're getting ready to to put everything together. One of the things that, you know, it's interesting to how court traditions still kind of stick around. But one of the things that they'll give you or they, they leave in your, in your table is this like feather. What? Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a long feather that like you can like... I guess what people used to write with. I don't know. Oh, a quill. Yeah, like, like a quill. Yeah. R- literally like the, what they used to use. Yeah. Oh, and so wow. it's there. And so uh, Ted kind of like leaned over. He's like, you know, you could take that. You could, you could just put it in your bag. That's your souvenir. <laughs> yeah. That's your Supreme Court yeah. swag. He goes, he goes, go ahead and put that in your bag. <laughs> um, and so Noel Francisco arrives. He's the Solicitor General representing the United States at that point. And he knows Ted. He says hi to him. And, and Ted says, hey, let me introduce you. I go over and say hi. And Ted says, you know, he's the first DACA recipient to be admitted and to argue the case before the Supreme Court. Wow. And I think no, for instance, uh, Solicitor General Francisco, I think, was also a little shocked to see, like, oh, this case is, like, right in front of me, even, yeah. you know. And so and then it goes by so fast, you know, we're because we're, there's a lot of spinning plates. And so we're trying to get ready for everything as the argument is happening. And and before you know it, it's it's over. After the arguments, you know, we we step back and, and we meet very quickly before we go address the public. And it was hard to be optimistic. We felt that the oral arguments were super tough. Even Justice Sotomayor, who we we knew, you know, we knew we had an idea as to where she was going to vote. She had some really tough questions that, you know, we I, we felt that sometimes there was a sense of incredulity about it. Was the question that you were trying to overcome, was it process, like that whether or not the Trump administration had the right to rescind and then in the first place whether Obama had the right to start the program? Or was it about whether or not people who come here, you know, who have no choice in the matter and are undocumented as kids should have the right to stay and work? Like w- which question was really yeah. in front of the court? Yeah. So when the case got to the Supreme Court, there were... Um, there was two questions they were trying to figure out. One of the questions was, is DACA legal to begin with? Can President Obama or any president make a program like DACA through executive action? Uh, So is DACA legal? The second question or the other question that the Supreme Court was trying to grapple with is, was the way that President Trump ended the program legal? Can he just cut off the program like that without taking into account 
all of the repercussions that it may come from, from economic to uh, the impact on the society, all of the things. It seemed like there was a lot of discussion of this was a promise made by the administration. People came out of the shadows in many ways to trust the federal government with all of their information in order to receive DACA status. And then to rescind it was what, like a a serious harm, right, that could potentially put them in jeopardy and, and really affect their livelihoods and, and families. Right. And I think it was it, it's slightly more than that. It was being able to rescind the program without any justification as to the consequences that was kind of there was no reason decision making about yes we know that these were the consequences that are going to occur and this is why we're going to try to end the program anyway it was just we're ending the program and that's the end of the matter and so those were the two questions at the end of the hearing or once we got the decision the supreme court only answered one out of the two questions so whether daca was legal to begin with or did president trump and the program correctly, they answered only the second question and said President Trump did not end the program the way that they needed to because he didn't take into account all of the consequences that may come from ending the program. And so what effectively the Supreme Court said was, well, President Trump or any administration, if you want to end the DACA program, you can, but you have to be able to consider all of the things, all of the consequences and say that you consider it and then still say, despite these consequences, we want to terminate this program and we are acknowledging what the consequences are going to be, but we still want to end it. Yeah. And so. So you won, but it was an incomplete victory. Right. That's right. And and so one of the and I think this adds kind of like the human element to the case, because one of the things that I think is really important to just notice is the person who announced the DACA program was President Obama. He went out to the Rose Garden and announced it in 2012. When it was time to terminate the program, that that did not come from President Trump. He sent out Attorney General Jeff Sessions to do it because he knew that this program was so popular, he did not want this blowback. So when the, the Supreme Court decision came out and they said, well, the Trump administration, if you want to end this program, you have to say that you want to end this program and you have to say that you're aware of all these consequences that are going to happen, but you still want to end it. President Trump could have still done that within his term, but he decided not to because of how popular the DACA program is. And so he knew that there would be political consequences if he were to actually own the decision. So although we had won the battle, we still needed to see whether we were going to win the war about whether the DACA program was going to be rescinded. Or not. And then he just didn't end it. Yeah. Then it outlived his, his, his candidacy or his, uh, his term. So DACA recipients, they have to renew every couple of years. At a certain point, the program closed to new applications. In 2021, according to The New York Times, the number of active beneficiaries of DACA, likely because people found ways, like they maybe through marriage and other ways to become, to have legal status, the recipients have dwindled to about 500,000. Um, so no new applicants. What is it like to be on DACA right now? Like, how firm do you feel your standing is in terms of your ability to work and do what you want to do with your life? Yeah. As part of the DACA program, we have to renew. Our, our, our DACA is approved for every two-year increments. So a little before the two years, we have to pay the fee and file to renew and get it again. DACA is, again, under attack through another lawsuit in Texas where they're seeking to answer the first question that wasn't answered at the Supreme Court, which is, is DACA legal to begin with? Because uh, the Supreme Court left that for another day. The state of Texas and a group of other conservative states have filed a lawsuit to try to just have a court say, well, this program is unlawful to begin with and pick up where the Supreme Court left off last time. A uh, court in Texas did rule the program unlawful and went up to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit did the same. And so this case is is certainly going to end up back at the Supreme Court uh, with a different composition now. Uh, now they have Justice Amy Comey Barrett there. So the balance of the judiciary tips more a lot more now in, in, on the conservative side. And so even um, were we to convince again uh, Ch Chief Justice Roberts about the legality of the program or just get him to be on our side, 
I think that the conservative justices still have the vote to end DACA. And so we're clear eyed that if this case goes to the Supreme Court again, it's likely going to end. And we're also clear eyed that this case is likely going to end up at the Supreme Court this upcoming spring. And so we're all, I think, planning for that. And so one of the ways that I think that the Biden administration is trying to soften the blow or mitigate the impact of individuals with DACA who might lose it is that he recently announced that he was going to ease some of the the restrictions that there are for DACA recipients to apply for work visas. Yeah, they announced this in June, um, and it has to do with speeding the amount of or speeding the process for DACA recipients to get visas through their employers. That's right. So do you think that that will significantly help current DACA recipients to then kind of hop over to another lily pad, as I've heard uh, some other another immigration attorney call it, like hop over to this other lily pad that will be a stable footing to remain and work in the United States? I think it's going to help a number of them, but I don't, I, there's still going to be a lot of people who are left out. Um, DACA recipients who didn't get to go to college, who joined the workforce instead, or maybe are not working in the degree that they uh, receive. Because there's kind of a higher bar for, it has to be you know, what to qualify for this new Biden program for the work visas. Yeah, we're still see, waiting to see on the specifics. But what the the White House had hinted at is that it has to be a high skilled job mm-hmm. um, based on an advanced degree. And so uh, we still kind of need to figure out what that means. And the specifics are going to are going to be rolled out soon. But um, it's it's certainly not going to catch everybody, I think. But I think it is going to help a percentage of the DACA folks to jump from one lily pad to another um, and at least mitigate some of the damage that there might be if DACA just completely goes away. Yeah. Let's talk about the other candidate for president right now. We've seen what President Biden at least is trying to do for DACA recipients. In an interview last month, former President Donald Trump said he believes that any person who graduates from a U.S. college or university should be granted a green card. Um, And he promised to make it law should he become president again. Um, Of course, it was President Trump's administration. I don't know if you remember 10 minutes ago that we were just talking (laughs) about trying to dismantle DACA. Um, What do you make of what he's saying here. I mean, he I think because he sort of changes his message in front of various audiences. I mean, what kind of expectations do you have for a second Trump term and how he would treat DACA, but also, you know, uh, people's path to uh, status overall? Yeah, it, it's hard to know because he, his his message changes depending on who he's talking to. I think this was a really pro-business podcast That's that right. he was talking to. And this sounds great to employers. They want people to get status faster and be able to hire them. Yeah. I mean, my initial impression of that was that it really speaks to the momentum and the popularity of the DACA program and how even if he's switching his message um, and he's now saying that he believes that dreamers or DACA recipients should be able to receive some sort of pathway to, to legal status based on graduating from college, we p- have pushed him this far at least um, to, to at least say that in some sort of his messaging. Because he saw the blowback too during the uh, case that you were involved in to defend DACA. He saw the people who were coming out and telling their personal stories and the damage that that did, I think, politically. I think that's exactly right. I think that he saw not just the blowback from the general public, but there was a lot of uh, what are called amicus briefs, which are briefs that are filed for, by individuals who are not involved in the court proceedings but still want to have their message be heard by Fortune 500 companies, by different CEOs from major corporations saying that not only is this a great program that should be supported, but terminating this program is going to have millions and millions of dollars of impact well into the future. And so I think that the candidate Trump likes to consider himself a business person. I think that he's also kind of considering that, that like, okay, this might even just be a wrong business move. But I, I think it goes to the, it really goes to show the popularity of this program, this specific program. But, you know, it's hard to know what, what he's going to do from that because he might just change it next week. 
Well, of course, Congress could act. Uh, the DREAM Act was what, you know, was the seed that eventually led to President Obama creating DACA. But, of course, the DREAM Act, even though, um, you know, polling shows it was it was popular, the idea of protecting kids who were brought here as minors, um, protecting their status was popular with people. DREAM Act couldn't make it through Congress. We've seen that even bipartisan border security measures can't make it through Congress. Any expectations for a legislative solution here? I think so. And I think that that comes from two ways. I think since the DREAM Act was enacted in, in two, or at least was introduced in 2000 and back in 2001, right, um, I think now more and more people are starting to become familiar and sympathize and empathize with dreamers. I think 10 years ago, if you were to tell somebody, uh, I'm a dreamer or I know a dreamer, I think they might be like, what's that? Uh, but now if you say, oh, he's a dreamer, you will automatically know what they're talking about and I think um, have a level of sympathy or empathy. I also think that there has been a bit of a shift, too, in in the way that the immigrants' rights movement has, has been approaching politics. Um, I, I think, you know, back in even as, as, early, as, as early as the Obama administration, when there was a big push for immigration reform, there was this push of like, an all or nothing deal. Like we either all get status or, or none of us get status. And that also kind of helped things keep stagnant because if they, if it was an all or nothing approach, uh, then, then, then nothing's going to get done. The and, compromise doesn't happen. Right. And so I think, I think with so many years of that, that just wasn't working. I think that the politics have changed a little bit to say, okay, well, we'll take a compromised approach at least to get something, and then we can figure the rest of it out later. And, so, and what does that look like? Like college graduates or like this idea that, you know, you staple the green card to your diploma? I think it would look something like that, uh, Some something where individuals who were brought here as children who have been here for several years and pass a background check would uh, be able to get a pathway, maybe even if it's a long pathway to legal status. Certainly a long pathway for legal status is something that has been done before. It happened in the 80s when the uh, you know, so-called amnesty happened. It wasn't just a green card right away. It was a long process. But Under the Reagan administration. That's right, under yeah. under the, a conservative administration. And so I think it would be, it would look like something like that, but I think it would also come with increased border security, uh, likely restrictions on individuals who are going to be coming in in the future uh, for that to make it very difficult for for anybody else coming in. And so I think it would likely be coupled with something like that if it was going to look like anything. But would we have to see a significant change in the composition of the House or the Senate? Because at this point that we had a hugely conservative uh, in composition bill that increased the number of border security agents that increase the number of judges that would hear asylum claims. Um, and it was shot down because President Trump, former President Trump, didn't want that to be passed during an election year um, because he would he was afraid it was going to help Biden. Like, um, do you think that a compromise on dreamers is possible under our current politics? I think so because of the popularity of the program. You know, the, what the statistics have shown was that uh, roughly about 80 percent of Americans support the DACA program. That's huge. I don't know of any other subject that 80 percent of Americans agree on. And so to have this level of agreement, I think, and Congress knows that the constituency supports this program. And so it, where a program like this uh, and some sort of legislature be proposed um, and they would vote against it, I think that they would have to answer to their constituency. And I think they would be it, it would be difficult to find a reason why. Luis Cortez Romero is an immigration attorney based in Kent. He's also a DACA recipient and he is the first undocumented attorney to be part of the team arguing a case before the U.S. Supreme Court. The documentary From Here, From There, De Aquí, De Allá, premieres on PBS on Tuesday, July 9th at 10 p.m. You can also watch it at pbs.org or the PBS app. Luis, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the conversation, and I hope that we can keep in touch on what you're working on. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Soundside. This show is only possible because listeners support us. If you're able to give right now, please check out the show notes for a link to donate. And don't forget, you can listen live on KUOW 94.9 FM Seattle at noon and 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday or anytime online at KUOW.org.